The Big Bang took place with the explosion of the point that contained all the matter and energy in the universe. It dispersed into the universe with incredible speed. Out of this explosion came galaxies, stars, planets, our sun, the Earth, and the laws of physics themselves were formed. Now, explosions usually do not bring about order. All observed explosions tend to destroy and disintegrate order. Now, if we were to find a very detailed order as a result of an explosion, it would only be logical to conclude that there was an intelligent intervention behind this explosion. Working as an astronomer for the prestigious Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge University, Dr. Fred Hoyle had staunchly opposed the Big Bang by championing the steady state cosmology until he was convinced by the overwhelming evidence. However, that was not the fact that led him eventually to an intelligent design position. Although he originally professed the atheist faith, Hoyle proved he was truly willing to follow the scientific evidence wherever it leads. Good scientific theories make predictions which are later verified by evidence. While trying to work out the way stars manufacture chemical elements, Hoyle observed that one particular nuclear reaction, the triple alpha process, which generates carbon, would require the carbon nucleus to have a very specific energy for it to work. The large amount of carbon in the universe, which makes it possible for carbon-based life forms like human beings to exist, demonstrated that this nuclear reaction must work. Based on this notion, Hoyle made a prediction on the energy levels in the carbon nucleus that was later proven by experiment. However, these energy levels, while needed in order to produce carbon in large quantities, were statistically astronomically unlikely. Hoyle later wrote, Would you not say to yourself, Some supercalculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom. Otherwise, the chance of my finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. Of course you would. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Hoyle was an atheist until that time and said that this suggestion of a guiding hand left him greatly shaken. Consequently, he began to believe in God. Now with this in mind, let's examine the data from the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE satellite, once more. COBE not only found ripples, but very precisely, finely tuned ripples. The ripples show that the explosion and expansion of the universe was precisely tweaked to cause just enough matter to congregate to allow galaxy formation, but not enough to cause the universe to collapse back in on itself. Any slight variation one way or the other, and none of us would be here to tell about it. In fact, the ripples are so exact, down to one part in 100,000, that Kobe Project leader George Smoot called them the machining marks of the creation of the universe and also the fingerprints of the maker. This fine tuning clearly points to intelligent design. There are many such factors in the fine tuning of the universe as Oxford mathematician John Lennox explains. More and more has been discovered by physicists and cosmologists that give evidence of a universe that's very finely tuned. That is, certain of its basic properties, the fundamental constants that govern what the universe is like, have to be within very, very finely defined limits in order to have a universe like we have on which carbon-based life is possible. And we call that the fine-tuning of the universe. For example, the ratio of the electromagnetic force to gravity in the early universe has to be accurate 
to about one part in 10 to the 40 in order that we can have the chemistry of the universe as we now see it. Now, one part in 10 to the 40, to get some idea of that, let's imagine that we covered, say, the whole of Russia with small coins. And we built the piles of coins over the whole of Russia to the height of the moon. And then we took a billion systems like that and we painted one of the coins red and we asked you to blindfold a friend and go and find it. They'd have got about one chance in 10 to the 40 of finding it. So it's a very small probability. Now the Genesis creation account was never intended to be a scientific explanation. It was written more to explain why God created man and what went wrong than to be a treatise on how he did it. Yet, with all of its elegant simplicity, it preempted modern scientists by some 3,000 years in its claim of a finite universe. Now you might ask, what about the age of the universe? Isn't that now the point of contention with modern science? Well, slowly but surely, man is catching up to that truth as well. The expansion factor of the universe, coupled with general relativity, has far-reaching implications. Now, looking back in time, cosmologists estimate that the universe is 15 to 16 billion years old. The Big Bang cosmology brings not just space and matter into existence, but time as well. Time is the fourth dimension. Now, how you see time depends on where you're viewing it from. Time is also affected by gravity. For example, a minute on the moon goes faster than a minute on the Earth, and a minute on the sun goes slower. Now, taking into account the expansion factor of the universe, every time the universe doubles, perception of time is cut in half. Now, when the universe was very small in the beginning of time, it was doubling very rapidly. But as the universe gets bigger, the doubling gets exponentially longer. The rate of expansion quoted in the textbook, The Principles of Physical Cosmology, says that the expansion factor is roughly 10 to the 12th. Now, consider that the biblical creation account was dictated to Moses from God's perspective, not an earthbound perspective. Nuclear physicist Dr. Gerald Schroeder has calculated the duration of creation from the perspective of the singularity with rather surprising results. The calculations come out as follows. The first of the biblical days lasted 24 hours viewed from the beginning of time perspective, from God's perspective. But the duration from our perspective looking back, it was 8 billion years. Now the second day from the Bible's perspective lasted 24 hours, but from our perspective looking back, it lasted half of that previous day, 4 billion years. The third day also lasted half that previous day, 2 billion years. The fourth day, 1 billion years. The fifth day, 1 half billion years. The sixth day, 1 quarter billion years. Now quite astonishingly, that's 15 and 3 quarter billion years. Is it a mere coincidence that modern science now vindicates the six days of the Genesis creation account? You see, the more you understand modern physics and the relative nature of space-time, the more comfortable the Genesis account becomes. If there's no God, why is there something rather than nothing? That's a question that demands an answer. And in light of the evidence, we are left with only two options. Either nothing created something out of nothing, or else something supernatural created something out of nothing. Atheists will rarely admit that they believe in self-creation. They usually mask it with concepts such as chance creation or spontaneous generation. Yet self-creation or spontaneous generation is analytically false. The law of non-contradiction is the foundation of formal logic. To say something is self-created is to assert that it's its own cause and its own effect. For this to be true, it would have to exist before it existed. It would have to be before it was. But what if Hamlet had said to be and not to be? That is the question. Shakespeare's profundity is reduced to an absurdity. For the universe to have no cause, the universe would have to be and not be at the same time. 
Sadly, this is exactly what many atheists force themselves to accept in a variety of various disguises such as spontaneous generation, or they ascribe magical creative powers to chance. Chance is not a thing. It cannot cause anything. It appears atheists prefer to sacrifice reason rather than face the inherent responsibility implied by the acknowledgement of a creator. Now, astronomer Robert Jastrow says, Consider the enormity of this problem. Science has proven that the universe exploded into being in a certain moment. What cause produced this effect? Who or what put the matter and energy into the universe? Science cannot answer these questions. For the scientist who has lived by faith and power of reason, our story ends like a bad dream. We have scaled the mountains of ignorance. We're about to conquer its highest peak. We pull ourselves over the final rock and we are greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries.